All right, good afternoon, everyone. It looks like we've got a uh, packed house here, which is great to see. So thank you all very much for coming out. My name is uh, Andy Olson. I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. Um, and I'm proud to be the uh, panel lead for a great panel we have today, True Performance and the Science of Randomness. We have quite the distinguished list of uh, panelists for you today. We have Phil Birnbaum from uh, Saber, Benjamin Alomar from the Cleveland Cavaliers, Jeff Ma from 10Xer, Nate Silver from New York Times, Alex Shiner from the Cleveland Browns, and we're very lucky to have our own Daryl Mori here moderating the panel for us this afternoon. Uh, the panel is going to run till 3.20 p.m., and we're going to save about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. If you'd like to submit a question to the panel, please do so via Twitter. You can tweet your question, followed by hashtag SSAC13, hashtag the room number here, which is 210. So again, your question, followed by hashtag SSAC13, hashtag 210. All right, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Daryl. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Um, really excited today. Uh, I thought with I thought if we made the title this geeky that we get less people, we got more people, uh, I th which is pretty impressive. I'm really excited to uh, be leading this conversation. We're going to make it interactive. We might go to questions earlier, so make sure you're uh, getting those in so I can so I can see them. Um, I think you know basically this panel gets at the heart of my job and uh, Alex's job now and he, w he was at the Cowboys, that was his job and, um, and uh, Nate when worked on baseball and Jeff has advised basketball teams and you know uh, also famous for uh, uh, being a big part of the MIT blackjack team. Um, Ben's with the Cavaliers. So like separating true performance from randomness is, is really the core of our job and then forecasting that going forward. So, you know, this panel, you know, cuts to the heart of it. I thought I'd start with um, maybe, a, may, maybe, like, the folks here, like, when I, earlier today I talked about, you know, how much randomness was in my chance to get the, you know, to get, to have the coach put me in the game and get a chance to have the career I've had. And there were so many random events, it's, it's humbling and sort of scary. You don't know where you'd ended up. And I thought we'd get from the panel uh, as well, like, how, most of them felt like it was 90% random that they ended up on this panel today when they gave me the feedback. Uh, now, I think all these folks are very smart and hardworking. They would have been successful in whatever they did, but to get to this moment, you, if you really think about it and you, and you, it's, it's, there's so much serendipity involved, it's amazing. So I'll start with Alec, um, new president of my hometown. Cleveland Browns, a lot of pressure on Alec because he needs to turn around my moribund franchise that's been just horribly mismanaged for many years, so I'm excited. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, this will be a bad panel um, because we didn't prepare for it because Daryl was just killing me on the Cleveland Browns for the last 30 minutes, I was. so don't be surprised. Um, yeah, I, I would put it at at least 90% on how random it is that I'm here. And incredibly, I can kind of trace it back to one moment that I had. I worked at a big law firm in DC, and I was actually doing Latin American private equity work. And I wanted to be like the undersecretary of Latin American affairs at some point. And I worked for this guy, and he was from Peru. And he came into my office one day. And this was like my third year at the law firm. And he said, I've got good news and bad news. I was like, all right, well, I'll take the bad news first. And he said he was leaving. I said, well, what's the good news? And he said, I'm going to be prime minister of Peru. <laughs> and so my boss went to become prime minister of Peru, and then I was left really without a department because he led our department. Went down the hall, and there was a guy named Dick Cass who was headed up our corporate department. And I just asked him if I could help out on a project. And while I was in his office, Jerry Jones called. And, you know, he kind of put it on mute, and he looked at me and he's like, can you help with this project? And I said, yes. And um, ultimately, that's how I ended. I know, now everyone's like, why is this guy on this panel? <laughs> that was, was that's like, even, that's too to random from, for everyone. I was trying to get from here. Peru to the Browns. Yeah. That was tough. Right. So that's, that's my amazing. story. Nate? Uh, so probably 95%. You know, I'm not saying the overall percentage of skill versus luck in my life, but to have gone this exact route has been very serendipitous in a lot of ways. Um, prior to the 2000, or last year's election, um, 
We courted controversy when I, uh, so Joe Scarborough was on Twitter one morning, running off like he can sometimes. And so I offered to bet him a thousand bucks on, on who would win. He said it was a toss. I'm like, okay, well, you know, let's kind of test your, test your belief here. And I think Obama's a favorite, bet a thousand bucks on Obama. He said, let's give it a charity. I'm like, actually, why don't we bet 2,000 bucks and give half of it to charity instead? <laughs> um, but I got, <laughs> uh, I got reprimanded by the, uh, by the public editor of the New York Times. And, but the thing was, uh, the amount of money I actually had on the line on election night, and this is something where we thought, because of Hurricane Sandy, it became a little bit clear at the end. But still, you're taking a lot of risk. And there were probably you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars in future earnings potential on the line for me, in part because as much as I can say, well, Romney was going to win in some of these alternate universes. He certainly had a chance. It wasn't a done deal. Um, you know, I think we tend to be a very results-oriented society, especially when you have a very small sample size. And so I knew I had an awful lot on the line. So I, I'm someone who I think has gotten lucky at several points in my life. And I think anyone else panel say you have to work really, really hard. Um, not to be kind of filtered out, but, um, but some luck along the way helps as well. Yeah, I think um, my being here is probably what, a two or three standard deviation event. I mean, it's uh, essentially, that was a nerd humor. Uh, you know, I, I was part of the MIT Blackjack team, and there were a lot of us. But I had a friend by the name of Ben Mesrick, and Ben had written six books at that time, but his career was pretty much in the shitter. And I convinced him to write this book called Bringing Down the House, which he didn't even want to write. He said, no one's going to want to read a book about a bunch of MIT nerds. And then I took him with me to Vegas, and he was like, oh my god, we should write this book. We went to his publisher, and his publisher was like, no one wants to read a book about a bunch of MIT nerds. We didn't listen to her. We wrote the book. It was on the New York Times bestseller for over a year. A guy by the name of Kevin Spacey read the book and liked it so much, he turned into a movie called 21, which was number one in the box office two weeks in a row and made $150 million off a $35 million budget. Um, the book Moneyball came out, and I realized that I, that was my opportunity to pursue my true passion, which was in sports. So a guy by the name of Daryl Morey was at the Celtics at that time looking for someone to come in in a low-level job. I showed up at his door, and I was like, let me do anything. Let me you know, get your coffee. He said, sorry, I don't think you're qualified, so I never got that job. <laughs> uh, actually, Mike Zarin still has that job today. Uh, but, um, I didn't, but that was like my foray to start looking at sports, and I ended up starting a sports uh, consulting business um, and a sports business that we later t sold to Yahoo and just through all the relationships that I started developing there, I started coming here and it was, it's a lot of luck. Actually, my, my story sort of picks up where Jeff left off because when he started that little sports company, one of the consultants he hired was me, um, which was one of the, the first uh, sports job I ever had. And I had never read Moneyball because I wasn't a baseball guy. I didn't really know anything about what was going on. I didn't, had never heard of Bill James or anything. But they need an economist to help them build a stock market sports fantasy game. Um, so they hired me. And in there, while I was there, we got to, I got to meet Roland Beach, uh, who's now with the Mavericks, Aaron Schatz with Football Outsiders, and learned about everything that was going on. And I was like, well, that's what I want to do. I don't want to be doing tobacco control work anymore. <laughs> um, so from there, I started working. And we, you know, at, at ProTrade, we developed a model for the Portland Trailblazers on the draft. And this is where sort of things get totally random. So they let us write about it on our website. And with that article that I wrote, um, Sam Hinkie, who works with the Rockets and Daryl, um, called me up out of the blue and said, eh, I read your piece. It's interesting. Tell me about it. So we chatted, uh, had some disagreements about a couple of the players, and said, OK, nice to meet you. Um, and then about a year later, he's, uh, he calls me and says, so um, I gave your name to Sam Presti. He's just got hired in Seattle, and he kind of needs somebody with your skill set. Um, are you interested? I said, sure. Uh, and so that's, and then from there, I spent five seasons with, with Sam in, in Oklahoma, and now uh, I'm with Cleveland. So that's all of those random events, starting with Daryl rejecting Jeff, um, <laughs> got me here. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah I appreciate it. You did pretty well. That was the one non-random event. <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, that was a highly skilled decision. <laughs> yes. Phil? Um, well, um, I guess uh, my situation is a little different. All these guys are famous, um, they work for sports teams, they've got stories about the, the, you know, the lucky break they got or the lucky situation they got that got them um, where they are now. I'm just, um, I'm just a guy who, uh, who blogs about sabermetrics from home, 
but I, my view is a little different. My view is that, that I am just as, I guess, lucky uh, to be here as, as these other people because my view is that, you know, every little step you take in life is kind of random. And there are so many things that if they had happened to me differently, I wouldn't be here. If I hadn't, um, if I hadn't been interested in baseball when the Blue Jays came to Toronto, I wouldn't be here. If I hadn't read Bill James, I wouldn't be here. If, um, if I hadn't been uh, the age I am where Sabermetrics was just starting out and I was able to submit a paper to Bill James and have him encourage me and publish it, I may not have continued what I'm doing. So my view is that, that you know, it's, uh, it's like a one in a billion shot that, that anybody's in a particular place at a particular time and there's so much randomness in life that it's really hard to say this is the piece of luck that got me where I am now. I'm going to dig into the nitty gritty. I was going to do another preamble, but um, so to separate, the, and, and Nate famously basically re wrote a book on this topic, you know, separating the signal from the noise. We're using randomness instead of luck. Luck is sort of one version of randomness, like the stuff that comes out good. So that's why, that's why we chose randomness as the title. And you, so to, to eliminate, to find the signal in the noise, you need data. Uh, and anyone can take this question. You need data to do that. And in all these sports, um, obviously there's changing environment, changing circumstances. So as, as you gather data and sort of maybe hone in on what is the signal from the noise, uh, one of the main issues uh, is that it then, you know, by the time you have enough to separate the signal, then the environment may have changed and sort of, sort of a time windowing problem. And uh, anyone on the panel wants to address, you know, maybe the, the best techniques for attacking this, and it's super relevant in football where, you know, I just, I'm really worried about football because it's, it's extraordinarily hard to attack it like we have baseball and basketball. Anyone brave and want to take well, that I, question? I know on the, it's uh, going to take it. Right. <laughs> I know on the baseball panel there was discussion about getting back to the root causes of things, and I think that's important, where if you track, for example, players' batting average, in May, you do a scattered plot in his betting average in June, it looks like there's no correlation at all. The sample sizes are too small to produce much effect, of course. We know that some hitters are a lot better than others over the long term. Or if you look at a stat like wins and losses in baseball, where um, there's a lot of randomness there. If you look at ERA, it's a little bit more stable. If you go to the like, strikeout and walk rate, it's better still. But now you actually can say who throws at what velocity and in which situation. So you get further and further remove from, uh, from just the performance metric toward the root cause, and then you can, you can make stronger predictions. And I, and I would take, you know, one thing that you said, um, you know, the, the reason that people think you're so good is because you were right, right? But that's also a bad way to look at things, because in, in general, we're often too results oriented. So if you can so, sort of separate the process or the decision from the outcome, you're halfway there, or 95% or of the way there. What I mean by that is, when you see something in the data that doesn't make sense or that isn't stable or that you're making a theory on, try to figure out, as he's saying, what the root cause is. Try to understand what the underlying reason is. Like last year in the NBA, scoring was way down at the beginning of the year. And you know, why is scoring down? Is it just an anomaly? Is it, but fundamentally, things were different, right? You know, guys looked like they never played together. They weren't able to practice. The, it was a totally different situation and scoring was down. And then if you looked actually back at the last NBA lockout, Scoring was down that year also. So these kinds of things are not stable over time and the data time window you have to be careful about. But if you actually focus on your process and not necessarily your result, you're gonna be in a better place to reduce randomness. I think Jeff's got it right. I mean, especially in football where it's so hard, I think most of the mistakes are made where people rely on the outcome rather than the process. And you can draw all kinds of conclusions from what happens, but that doesn't mean they're right. And so we spend time actually trying to take the opposite approach. Instead of trying to figure out the exact things that correlate to success, we're just trying to say these are the things that don't correlate to success. We feel like we have an advantage there. I'll give you guys just kind of a funny story about this. So people are so focused on outcome in the NFL that they end up just looking at wins, right? And there are only 16 of these games. And um, I just got hired. I got hired by Jimmy Haslam and Joe Banner. And then I've put together, I think, a pretty good team, right? We've hired people from different teams that I think are pretty talented people. Team of employees. Right, exactly. Um, <laughs> team of employees. <laughs> not, a not a football team, yeah, as Daryl reminded me earlier. 
And so we get this good group together, and I'm feeling good about it, and people in the industry are saying, this is a good group. And someone sends a long email to Joe Banner and Jimmy Haslam. And it's like, you know, you've been getting a lot of good press for the people you've hired, um, but I gotta tell you something, this is not a good team. I said, they're all a bunch of losers. None of them have ever won, <laughs> you know, because we had a guy from Jacksonville, a guy from the Padres, I guess he thought the Cowboys hadn't won enough. And it shows you kind of, they were, he was taking it at the highest level of, these people aren't very good because they've never won Super Bowls. And if you look at the teams that have won Super Bowls, are they doing everything right? Well, we had an anecdote like that similar, which is, um, you know, a couple of our staff have gotten very good, both got chances to be GMs, and like, one of the owners I were talking to is like, every year you've won one, less games, every year. And uh, so I'm actually counting the wins this year <laughs> to like make sure we, we get that. No one cared if it was the lockout year or anything. It, just, it was just a simple straight line. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that, that's counting, good, right? Because if it's a lockout, you're going to win fewer games. For yeah, sure, right? I'm counting the wins. But I think, you know, the, as, as we point out, so the, the biggest mistakes are both on for too much focusing on outcome and then I think also misattributing uh, skill for, you know, signal for noise and noise for signal. What's, you know, what's an example of uh, where a big mistake has been made uh, in one of the sports, baseball, basketball, football out here, where, uh, you know, they, you thought a player was good because you thought he'd isolated, he was a good player, and it turned out to be completely crazy, or the, or the flip side, where a guy looked bad, but then you didn't give him a shot. Anyone? Yeah, I mean, the, the perfect example that we had talked about before this was the Odin-Durant decision, right? We were advising the Trailblazers at the time, and the numbers absolutely said pick Durant because Odin was injured during his rookie year or his freshman year in college. And, and, and now everyone has used that to go back and say, oh yeah, we, you know, there was a big thing in the blogosphere about how we told them to pick Durant. Well, there were a lot of people that were gonna pick Odin over Durant at that time. And the fact that Durant had looked so much better than Odin has a lot more to do with Odin being injured and never playing, which really has been pretty random because the injuries that he has now weren't injuries that he had in college. They're totally different. Um, so, you know, that's one where probably too much skill has been put into the idea that you should have picked Durant when the reality was it was an unfortunate circumstance for Odin. I, I, but I, I think the, that debate and other mistakes that happen in the NBA, you know, they come not only from results, but also from sort of biases baked into how people think about things. We all have biases. Uh, and in the NBA, I think a lot of, there's a built-in bias for seven-foot players who are athletic. Uh, and I think you know we we as a team uh, make a lot of mistakes. You know, as a league, I should say, make a lot of mistakes around those kinds of players. Uh, and I think once you understand sort of the variance in those players, is that there is no guarantee that a seven-foot athletic big man is going to have success in the NBA um, as part of your process. Then you can start looking at these players a little more realistically and say, oh, just because he's seven-foot and athletic doesn't mean that. You know, that doesn't give us, that's not the signal. That's, that's just bias. Uh, and uh, Phil, and one thing you might want to look at too is when you're evaluating a player, you're evaluating him on a, a bunch of different dimensions. And it might even be a good idea to keep in mind just how much um, randomness there is in that particular measure you're using. Uh, for instance, if you've got one guy who hit uh, 325 with little power and one guy who hits um, 250 with power, with 30, 35 home runs, and you're trying to um, evaluate their true talent, there's going to be a lot less variance in the home run total than the batting average total, because if you go out and you do the math, the guy with, who's the 35 home run hitter probably has a talent of at least 25 home runs. Nobody who's not a power hitter goes out and hits 35 home runs. But it is within reasonable bounds of probability that you've got your 290 hitter, your 300 hitter, he's gonna have a good year, he's gonna hit 325. So one thing when you're trying to get the signal uh, you know, uh, separate the signal and the noise is to have an idea of how much noise you're actually expecting to have in there because that makes a big difference. Yeah, that's one point I, go ahead, <clears throat> you know, one point I make in the, in the book uh, is that we think it's of... the signal and the noise. The yes. <laughs> I really like the promo. <laughs> it's on Amazon.com Amazon. 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 and Kindle. Um, but we think of kind of luck and, and randomness as being polar opposites when really they're not and it should be kind of a two-dimensional graph where you have, for example, a game like like poker, where over the long run, um, if you're bad at poker, you're gonna lose an awful lot of money, but you could, you, could, you could win in the short term. You could be like Jamie Gold and win the World Series of Poker, despite being a fairly bad player, in fact. Um, but, 
in the short run, there's all kinds of, it's a luck dominated event, but in the long run, then skill does matter a lot. So, so there's one question of how much short term interference and noise and randomness do you have, then you also have a question of how much does skill really determine the outcome in the long run. Those are, those are separate things sometimes. Which yeah. goes to Daryl's point, right, which is how much time do you have to prove this theory? And if you work for a professional sports team, often you don't have a lot of time, but you know it'll take a lot of time. And especially in the NFL when you might have 48 games to prove it, and people say, well, you've had enough time, and you really need 20 years to prove that if you do things right every step of the way, you'll have a real advantage. And we, I, could, I was back to Jeff's thing. I think it's a good... Um, Good test of how honest, uh, like everyone here said 90% uh, randomness, which I thought was more or less the right answer. It's a good test if you go back to the Durant-Odin decision, it's how I know if someone's being honest. If I ask them who they would take, if, they, if they're honest with me and they say Greg Odin, then I, I feel better. Uh, pretty much every team would have taken, taken Odin at the time. One, one thing I wanted to explore is the, we have two tools to separate the signal and the noise. We have uh, our human judgment, Right, which is based on our past experience, and we have data using analysis and, and computers. And computers can't even generate a random number. They have to like, I don't, I don't even, people probably don't know that. Like, they have to be like ginned up in 20 different ways and pull signals from the power line to like figure out a random, they, they literally can't, they can generate a random stream, but they can't actually produce a random number. So computers have weaknesses, humans have strengths. Uh, using those two tools together is what we try and do to try and make better decisions. And what are humans good at? What are computers good at? And how do you, how, how do you balance that? So, uh, so humans are, are good at finding patterns. And the problem is that sometimes we have overactive imagination. So if you generate, um, if you have your computer through its process generate a uh, pseudo random string of ones and zeros and create a stock market chart with it and show it to like a technical trader, um, he'll be convinced that it says something deeply meaningful. We see patterns in the noise all the time and random data. Um, but the flip side is that we really do need that ability to make hypotheses about, um, about what's really going on. And the simple example that, that Jeff gave where, for example, let's say you're trying to uh, decide whether to bet a lot of over-unders in the NBA. Um, if you have a hypothesis like, well, they had a lockout and so these guys are rusty, there's a reason why you had scoring down, then um, you might make that bet, whereas you might not if it were just a random anomaly. Um, and so that's, that's the key, I think. So I think computers, you want to be disciplined when you're actually using statistical tests to separate out uh, luck from, from skill, and our bias tends to be to overrate how much skill there is and be too, uh, and be too kind of results oriented. Um, but yeah, so basically that's the thing, I think that's one of the best ways to use rigorous statistics and computers is for that particular application. And I, I think like the, the big thing is humans are really good at asking questions, right? And computers are really good at sort of answering them. And one of the things I think that, you know, I would challenge everyone in this room who's good at analytics to do is to start partnering with people that really understand the industries or the, the questions or the problems they're trying to solve. Because oftentimes, the, I think the, the, the biggest movement in analytics in the next 10 years is going to be people that really hate numbers actually starting to embrace the analysis, so they start to partner with people that understand numbers, because you know we can't ask all the questions. Like I'm sure when Daryl got involved in the MBA, there were tons of people he he talked to that hated him and hated the numbers, and but still gave him very valuable information and very valuable challenges to try to help him understand what kind of model to build. And so, I think that we all want to seem smart and whatnot, but you have to be very approachable and you have to make the people that are industry experts embrace you giving them more information or you helping them answer the questions that they can't answer themselves. Yeah. I, you know, I would add on to this that one of the things that you know, we, the computers do really well is, and data particularly do, does really well is help us sort of narrow the range of what randomness can be. Uh, and you know, we were talking before the, the panel about football and how hard football is because it really is. The data is not very good. Um, they're you know, exponentially more difficult than, than, than even basketball uh, because there's so many moving parts and we don't know what's going on most of the time. But um, if we stop looking for you know, data to give us the answer and instead help us let data reduce the risk around any de uh, decision we make and understand what the risk is. Because that, most of the time when you know, I think we make decisions 
very often we have no idea what the risk really is. And so to be able to use data to help at least inform what kind of risk we're taking, you know, uh, you know, one of Jeff's examples, are we hitting on, on 17 playing blackjack, or are we you know, making something that's less risky than that uh, as a decision? Where, where the rubber meets the road is when, when do you overrule what your models are telling you, either in the political world or what you saw at the Cowboys, now the Browns, or with uh, baseball and basketball? So we had, we had a big debate the last few years. Um, I think most, I mean, you can read this anywhere. Most people will say you shouldn't give up a lot of draft picks to move up, right? Um, on the other hand, most people say quarterbacks are incredibly valuable in the NFL. And if you can figure out a way to get a top five quarterback that can change your franchise for 10 years. And so I thought last year was a pretty interesting dynamic with RG3 and how much a team moved up to get them and whether or not that was the right move. I think most people in this room would say that was a bad move. Um, but we spent a lot of time trying to figure out if that was right or not, right? Because even on the surface, it seems like it's a bad move. Um, on the other hand, you know how rare a commodity it is. And the question is, how hard is it to determine in advance if this is that rare commodity? But so we spent a lot of, you know, we try to, we start from a place where we a think we know it. Bad and then, uh, tell me, five years, I'll tell you. Okay. <laughs> That's what I've learned in the NFL. Um, no, I think... Uh, probably at its, at its core is a bad move. But it'll probably turn out well, and then people will take something from that. Um, you know, I, first of all, it depends on how successful your algorithm is, right? I mean, if you have an approach to a problem which has failed anyway, even though it's data-driven, then sure, use your judgment as much as you want. Remember, they're really kind of two things, again, it's one of those things that's seen as one-dimensional, like, oh, should we use our judgment or should we use the numbers, right? Well, that's one dimension. The other dimension is, how far you get, period. Some things are just really hard to solve through any approach whatsoever. There's a lot of randomness involved. But in general, um, what you want to avoid, C to C, for example, we make forecasts in every Senate race every year. Um, and there might be one of two. There are 35 Senate races every year where I might say, here's some subjective factor that I think might override that prediction. So if that's your ratio, like one in 10 times, one in 20 times, hey, it's a special case. But you have to guard against saying that every case is special for a different reason. And you have to guard against cases where you have personal incentives that don't really um, affect the numbers or what you're looking at, but you know, that you're personally invested in an outcome coming true, then be, be more suspicious if your analysis happens to make you look good for that reason. So you know, it, should be, it should be rare, I guess, uh, uh, that you should deviate from your formula if you have a good formula. If you have a bad formula, then, um, then you have bigger problems to solve. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the core of it, right? You look at the, it's again, that same thing. You're looking at the underlying model. You're not necessarily looking at the result. And more even than that, the, you know, the one thing that, that I think we all face is this stable over time thing, right? Like every model you make, is it, does it still apply right now? And, and I think it's dangerous to, to get into a situation where you ignore your models because um, that's what makes emotional decision making happen. That, that's what makes you fall for cognitive biases, for recency bias, for things like that. Having a model helps keep you in check on that, but what you have to make sure is that that model really is stable over time. And it's just, you see it all the time in sports, all the time in basketball and football. Rule changes, things that happen change the way that the game is inherently played, and you have to keep evaluating that. I thought that was a big factor in Jeremy Lin, which was that uh, you know, the models really aren't built on Jeremy Lin. There really are no, you know, no offense, very few Ivy League players in the <laughs> in the NBA and so that that was even though he looked very good it was very hard to have a lot of confidence in the outcome of what he would be because the models weren't built on a data set that looked like looked like him any other thoughts well I have an example I have a question for you I remember when you guys uh -oh. drafted uh, Steve Novak yes right you asked me what our numbers said about him and we were like eh. and he was like well your numbers shouldn't have said anything because there's no one ever been like him before <laughs> but why why did you guys <laughs> why, did, why did you guys why did you guys give up on him we didn't give up on him okay it's uh it's uh, it's always a uh his defense <laughs> but uh no it's it's always a price you know return thing i mean he He's an unbelievable shooter. I thought he'd win the three-point contest. So, uh, guy, we, it was actually in the first year we drafted him. What shifting gears a little bit just might be relevant for this room is, 
you know, one of the conclusions of Nate's book and uh, Jeff's book, uh, which you haven't plugged yet, Jeff, but that's, that's all right. That was two years ago. It's fine. Oh, it's, it's all, already, this is all signal passed. and noise, not house advantage. Okay. <laughs> uh, is, you know, selling, selling our, you know, classically, you know, people who make decisions or own things want to hire experts. And they want to hire experts who are sure about their answers. Whereas what we're saying is, boy, all we can do is shift the odds. It's a much less, it's sort of like, it's sort of like conservative talk radio versus liberal talk radio. Like the conservatives are very sure about what, so it makes for great radio, people argue. Whereas on the left, it's like, ah, you know, it's sort of this, it's sort of that, you know, it just doesn't sell as well. So how, how, do, how do folks who are helping an organization shift the odds sell themselves? That's the hardest thing, right? Which is that you're not giving answers, you're just saying that we think we're more likely to do well if we do it this way. Um, and so we try to figure out things we're sure about. Let's, right? I mean, it sounds simple, but there are some things you can be sure about, and then you start peddling those things first. Then you gain confidence from people, and then you start getting into, I think you have better odds if you do this. Um, and so we, it's, it's kind of a constant sales process, because remember, whoever you're selling to, if it's a head coach, if it's an owner, whoever it is, they've had tons of success in the past making decisions from their gut. They have. And so you've got to kind of convince them that your way might help them have more success. But isn't that like, a, I feel like that's a really delicate balance because like if you look at someone like our friend Parag, right? Parag has spent 12 years in that organization basically being deferential, right? And Is Parag here? Probably not. He's no interest in us. But, uh, <laughs> but, what, but you know, what, what, but I would say that the organization would have been better off if he had taken a bigger seat at, at the beginning and really got some of his ideas in there. So how do you balance that? I mean, by being, you know, a leader in the organization and not wanting to overwhelm people, but really trying to, to make revolutionary ideas. Yeah, you, you pick your spots. You really do. Because if you don't and you come across as too aggressive, you'll never have a, have a seat at that table again. And if you look at, if you look at Prague and San Francisco, I think it's, it's worked pretty well. And I think he's figured out a way how to influence people. And... Um, you're right, unless you're fortunate enough to be Daryl, where you make every single decision and you have no one to answer to. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of this is just about... I'm just like uh, a smart owner. Is, you know, using analytics doesn't absolve you of the responsibility to run a good business and to have an organizational culture. Some of the stuff is basic management 101 stuff, where if you have a culture, people feel like they can contribute and, and not be scared to give a politically incorrect result that can help make the organization better in the long run, you'll have you'll have success with analytics and other tools. If you don't have that culture, then you can throw the numbers at the wall and it probably won't matter very much in the long term. Yeah, you know, I would add on to this that you know, one of the dangers that analysts face, and I, I ran into this problem myself uh, arguing in the draft, you, know, you have a result and you believe in it. You understand that there's uncertainty around it, but you enter into a uh, discussion and uh, trying to argue for your point of view with people who are certain that you are wrong. Um, and it's very easy to fall into a trap that's saying where you present yourself as certain that you are right when you know your model doesn't have that. Uh, and then you end up getting a text message from your general manager saying, why is Brooke Lopez kicking our ass right now? Um, so, you know, you, you have to be careful about that. Um, you got the text message. <laughs> so I, I think that's a, that's a good point and in, in line with what you're saying, Nate. I think that it's a good point and to you, this idea that if you create this culture around being data driven, right? And a, a, around trying to, you know, you have this expert that you say that might be in a different role off, opposed to you, but you try to create some data driven, you know, results around his decisions too, and just have a culture of doing that. That probably helps. Do not just say like, hey, I'm, I'm gonna be right all the time. He's not gonna be right all the time either. This is just our way of making better decisions by looking at what we're doing from a data driven sort of way. Phil? I, have a, I, I guess I have a question uh, uh, for you guys who, who work in sports, and that's what you're describing is that you, you, you put forward your decision, but at the same time you're saying that you're just shifting the odds a little bit. And does it come up that when you're, say, advocating a certain course of action, drafting a certain player, doing something this way or whatever, that you say explicitly, you know, I mean, we're moving the odds, we think we're moving the odds from 50-50 to maybe 60-40 in our favor, and it may not work, but 60-40 is pretty good. Do you ever talk about that? that, that Really, you have no idea if it's going to work out or not, but you think that this one is just a little better, and when it fails, we tried. 
Does that happen? I think you have to try to do that. Not, not quite necessarily as explicitly as that, but to make as you're, and, and it's not about that one decision. And, and if it comes down to that one argument you're having, you know, you, you've missed the boat. You know, you, you have to start from the beginning through the whole process of how you're utilizing analysis in the decision making process. And baked in, there's an understanding that there's risk involved, that there's no certainty in the data, and that even though we're putting one number on the page, um, you know, it's not a fact. Right. It's just a probability. But even if your number was absolutely correct, even if God came down and said this number is absolutely correct, there is still randomness in how the season's going to play out and just, you know, if the player's going to so miss his shots or make his shots. And it, even though you're absolutely right, it might still not work out. Yep. You, that goes back to the whole idea of separating the process from the outcome, right? And then people being too focused on the outcome. Because I'll sit behind my friends because I'm not allowed to play blackjack anymore and watch them play blackjack. <laughs> and if they have 15 and the dealer has a 9 and I tell them to hit, if they get 6 to make 21 and win, I'm a genius. If I, they get 7 to make 22 and lose, I'm a moron and they never should have made a movie or book about it. So, I mean, in both cases, the decision was correct. In one case, the outcome was poor or not. So, you got to emphasize that, that, that difference. Like, and you're saying that, hey, if it's a 40-60 model, that means 40% of the time it's not going to work. Right, and I'm, I'm wondering, does that come up, you know, when you're sitting around the table talking about these things, does that, does that kind of thing come up? You do it, and you have to remind people that, on the flip side, mistakes are made as well, right? I mean, so we could be wrong using data and increasing our odds, but you're just as likely or more likely to be wrong just watching the tape. And, and sometimes that gets lost in the shuffle. It's just, well, how's your data doing for us? Right? How's the analytics doing? And then you don't go back and look at how people are doing without it. I was fascinated by Nate's book. Sorry to plug your book again, Nate. The, the, <laughs> the signal and the noise. The signal and the noise, yeah. <laughs> We're all getting royalties now. <laughs> so the people who have been dealing with this the longest are the weather forecaster. They've yeah. always been about the probability shifting. And I was like learning tips. I was like, okay, I can't show 50-50 projections anymore because the owner would be like, well, what do I need you for? And 50-50, <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> so, so and a lot of low probabilities, they bump them up. I, I mean, I thought it was fascinating. Yeah, so the weather forecaster is cheap in different ways where they actually put more rain in the forecast than they really is because their incentives are, are asymmetric. Um, and they don't go with 50-50 forecasts, say 55% chance of rain or 45 flip a coin, because it seems like you're not adding any value, a funny kind of bias that we have. Um, but they did figure out early on the weather forecasters because of the short versions, because of chaos theory, that, um, that you're not going to get beyond a certain level of precision with the weather forecast. You can't quite be godlike to predict what every molecule in the universe is going to do. So they, they've always been thinking about how do you measure uncertainty and how do you, how do you convey uncertainty to the user as well. They think really carefully, work with behavioral economists on those hurricane maps that you see. Most government websites look like shit, but the weather forecasts, when they have a hurricane, they think very carefully about how does that convey information in a way that helps people make better decisions. So if you want to get hired in sports, <laughs> first talk to a behavioral economist, apparently, to <laughs> convince, convince the owner. All right, we got some questions from the audience. Um, I'm paraphrasing this question, but it's basically, OK, smart guys, we get you. <laughs> that outcomes are more important, but how do you, how do you measure good process? Ooh, um, <laughs> stumped the panel. OK, I'll try that one. Um, I guess um, what you're trying to do when you're trying to separate the signal from the noise <laughs> is Amazon.com. Uh, <laughs> um, is there's, the there's something specific that you're trying to figure out. For instance, you're watching you know, your team play a season and you're trying to figure out how much talent they have, how they're going to do next year, how good is this player or whatever. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to measure the talent, but you can't measure the talent. It's unmeasurable. You have to measure something else that correlates to talent. One thing you can measure is the, is the broad outcome. How many games did the team win? But there's a lot of noise in that. So what you can try to do is figure out something else to measure that maybe uh, correlates to the talent a little bit better so you get less noise. And for instance, what, if you look at uh, baseball, if you look at pitching statistics, you can look at a pitcher's one loss record, and that gives you some idea of how, how, good, how good he is, but it's got a lot of noise in it. 
So what you can do from there is you can go down to ERA and see how many runs it gives up, gives up. And that has a little bit less noise in it. It gives you a little bit better idea, more reliable uh, indicator of how good the pitcher is. And you can go from there and you can calculate his expected ERA based on what he gives up. And then you can go even farther and include uh, balls in play. Has he been lucky or unlucky on balls in play? What would you expect his uh, earned run average to be if he got average results on balls in play. So you can just measure different things and, and part of the process is to figure out, and that's part of what, what I guess Bill James taught us, is figure out relationships between performance and outcomes or between performance and talent that let you not eliminate the noise but do something that inherently just has less noise in it. I don't want to put you on the spot, Alec, but in a year, how will you know that the staff you put together is functioning better than the, the guy who emailed your owner? <laughs> well, I think, I think that's right what Phil said. I mean, I think you find some things that correlate to success, right? And then how often do you ignore those things? And so you can just picture a football game, decisions that are made during the football game. And there's some scenarios where you should go for it. And, you know, there might be a couple times where you feel like the it's snowing, so you shouldn't go for it. But if, you, if every time you ignore it, then you can look back and say, boy, our process wasn't that great, regardless of what the outcome was. So if, you're, if your coach um, you know, chooses to go for it on your own 40 and, and you lose the game because it doesn't, are you going to be mad at him? Or are you no, gonna we're going to be, be very happy, very happy. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think this is a really hard question, right? And obviously it's sort of, but I think that, you shouldn't say, I guess maybe we're saying a little bit too much of decision outcome, right? Outcome is obviously very important, but outcome over the right time horizon is what we're talking about, right? I think if you look at outcome in a too short of a time horizon, that's when you get into a lot of danger. So you, you have to use outcome to judge how good your process is at some level, but it has to be the right time horizon. Well, you, oh, but you Darryl, also, oh, go ahead. You can also make analogies by way of, <clears throat> of case study, and this is kind of what the, what the book tries to do, I guess, but it looks, it says, so of people who are using analytics well, what characteristics do they have as individuals, as organizations? And then people who are using it unsuccessfully, what are they doing differently? So you have to kind of learn indirectly sometimes when you have a really small sample size. It's almost like looking at, um, talk about, well, for a hitter, over the short run, you want to look at some measure of talent and not just a manifestation of it. It's the same thing really for, for managerial talent, is do they have characteristics that you know over the long run in different environments correlate with, with using data well and making good business decisions. And I think Daryl's point, I really wasn't trying to be funny. I mean, he, you should be happy when your coach exhibits brave behavior that, that syncs up with what you've learned. And, um, and then you want to reward that behavior or, or anyone in your organization. And so in that scenario, now I'm not saying you should go for it in that situation, but, but if you should, you shouldn't worry too much about the loss. Everyone else will worry about that anyway. You'll get hammered by the media. But internally, you want to support those kinds of decisions. Question I got, are what, what are some good, if you want to get into sports or if you want to get good at separating the signal from the noise, what are some good, uh, yeah, it's, uh, what are some good, uh, what are some good training? Like one, one, the specific question we got was, is gambling good training for that? <laughs> Uh, what other what other things might be good? Well, I mean, I, I think that yeah. I mean, I, I personally obviously think so. I think that gambling, especially as it pertains to games like poker and, and, and blackjack and whatnot, games where you can gain an advantage. Now, the, the technical nature of gambling is that you're putting something at risk and you're at a disadvantage. So what he does in poker and what I do in blackjack is not gambling because we have an advantage. But even that being said, there are a lot of times where you are going to lose. Like we lost, I lost $100,000 in two hands of blackjack and had to pick myself up to go back and keep playing. And that's the kind of thing that teaches you to be very religious about you know, how you make decisions and following numbers and being objective. Yeah, poker players are the best uh, I've seen at estimating probabilities on the fly. Um, not that they do everything in life well, but they have a very unique skill set. Um, I'd also recommend uh, backgammon, which is a game you can bet on if you want. Uh, one, thing that's, <laughs> one thing that's interesting about backgammon, though, is that, um, is that your mistakes cost you a lot, right? Where, so, for example, if I play against the iPad backgammon program, the smart version of it, right? I make the perfect play eight out of ten times, but I'm a fairly bad backgammon player because, you know, you're, the 20% of the time when you make a mistake, it can be a really, really 
catastrophic errors. So one thing analytics can do and good businesses do is at least filter out the really stupid decisions, right? If you can avoid making stupid decisions, then you won't always make great decisions, but, but that's a lot of success in, in business and in life is, is not wasting opportunities on something which is preventable. Any other training you guys can think of? Don't or, you or? play ping pong a lot? Oh, that's so helpful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I, well, one, one, one thing you can do if you just want to appreciate just how much randomness there is in the outcomes of sports is play one of those baseball simulation games like APA or Status Pro or, or Stratomatic because uh, what happens with those games is you just take a bunch of player cards that represent the skills of the players. You've got the talent and you know the talent for sure. It's 100% written on the card. And then you use dice rolls to, to run through a game. And you will find you'll play one game and it'll be 9-1 for this team and you'll play another game and it'll be 8-2 for the other team. And you'll have situations like the ones where we just talked about where you take out a crappy hitter and you put in a great hitter and he winds up striking out and you really get a feel for the fact that what happens during a game is, is very hard to predict. I, I would say just one thing to do is anytime you make a decision, estimate for yourself how likely you think, you know, what, what's the probability that you're right in that decision? And just try and keep track of that. And see how, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you'll have you know, 50 decisions over a period of time. You know, you should be able to calculate how accurate you are with that estimate of probability. Just a very basic thing that you can do to have a better understanding of just probability in general and decision making. And, and you know, that filters into all these different examples we're talking about is, you know, whether it's data based and I'm getting those probabilities from actual real data or whether I'm getting them from my own experience and judgment, um, we should be good about understanding what the probability of any given decision is. I think gambling is a great way to really test your belief, right? I know Nate did it famously <laughs> recently that, you know, it builds on Ben's point that, you know, if, if that estimate comes up high enough, you'll go ahead and make that wager. If it's not, you're going to be like, eh, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm ready to do that. So next year we'll be brought by, sponsored by Gamblers Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> um, question I had builds on what Phil said. Um, in baseball, I know they've... You know, we have a, even have Boris McCracken here found that a lot of the randomness can be eliminated on line drives versus grounders and fly balls and certain pitches, and you can you can you can basically regress all these sub components basically to try and get more to the true performance. But um, I think I wonder, and we, we've found it sometimes you can you can smooth your heart away until you've basically lost all original meaning of the of the data. I don't know if anyone have any thoughts on that. Alec, no. Oh. <laughs> Alec is like, don't like, ask me any technical. No math. <laughs> Are there going to be Excel <laughs> spreadsheets in this panel? That's a terrible Look, question. Look, no one wants that. <laughs> no one wants that. <laughs> you tried to put it's it off on me. That's a terrible me. question. Uh, um, any more from the audience? I'm going to take audience questions. I know it's breaking our, yeah, right there. We'll repeat it, but go ahead. One thing that's really detrimental to what we like to do is results-oriented focus of like the culture. Is there any way or anything that will change that to like appreciate the process? That's a good question. So how do you how do you build a, a culture that values the process over just the results? And I know that's something you're thinking about deeply now. It's it's almost impossible in sports. It really is. I mean, it's sad, but true. I, I, and I, I mean, just think about explaining that to your fans, right? <laughs> hey, we haven't won in 10 years, but we've been doing everything right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it doesn't so no, well. No. And so there's some little things you can do, right? Um, this is true. I, I'm not saying this for Daryl's benefit. Um, when we were with the Cowboys, I spent a lot of time talking about, look at the good things that the Rockets do. Look at how smart the people are that work there. Um, and look how hard it is to get some of the results, right, in the NBA. And, and people in the NBA, I think, understand it a little bit better. You, you know, for the most part, you need superstars, and it's, they can understand it. And so that was a good way for us to frame it, that even when you're making a lot of good decisions, these people we respect and admire, they're not winning championships right now. Now, they, hopefully they will in the future. But I like to kind of take it down to that level to make that point, because otherwise I think it's impossible. 
What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, I would just echo that in terms of it's education as to why you're doing the things that you're doing and trying to get more of a groundswell around, you know, like we go for it on fourth down more because of this reason or we, you know, we're, we're making this season ticket decision based on, you know, like all of the, all of the, like, the things that you do, if you can justify them and you really focus on that, I think that helps. I can just say personally, we ha you have to hire people you're going to respect. Um, you then have to listen to them. You can't overly, like, uh, one of the things I think teams try to do is, like, really measure their scouting staff. And that, that has some advantages, which is, you know, which ones are better than worse. It makes total sense. Um, until you think about hammering someone over their prior judgments. And, and so it's very difficult then to create a collaborative culture where you're going to have uh, feedback where you're then also hammering them over their individual results. So I try to, I personally try to stay focused on process, always listening. This is all going to sound pie in the sky, but I think it's true. And one of the things that's hard in sports is information is really important. And if it gets out, it's challenging. So there has to be a really high trust level too uh, because a lot of the teams don't have as much of a collaborative process because the information will get out and then it creates this really negative sort of feedback loop, basically. So Kevin Compton, I'm sure you're familiar with him, was owned the San Jose Sharks until recently and is a very famous and successful venture capital guy. He used to always talk to owners and like prospective owners and the first rule he told them, the first thing they do when they own a team is to cancel their local newspaper subscription. So the idea <laughs> that you only look internally at what you're doing and stop focusing on what everyone else is saying, I think will help you also continue to That's focus smart, on but it won't work. They, they, <laughs> they, everyone's going to read everything anyway. So, I mean, I, I, yeah, trying to tune that out is hard. I'll take another one from the audience here in the front. Um, so, to be good in sports, you obviously have to make good decisions, but because only one of 30 or 32 teams can win, are you incentivized to be extra risky if the end goal is to win the championship? Question is uh, it's a competition of 30 to 32. Uh, are, is the structure of one team being happy at the end of the year mean you should take more risky decisions? I mean, that's, like, there were two things that I remember that you told me when you first started with the Houston Rockets. One, the first thing, we talked about baseball and, and basketball, and I said, you know, Daryl had, had done some work in baseball, and I said, doesn't it scare you that basketball's so hard and, and so random and there's so much noise there? And he said, well, you know what, because it's so hard, that's where I'm able to gain an advantage. In baseball, a lot of the advantage is gone because everyone has the same sort of tools. But in basketball, because it's so hard, I, I always use this analogy for blackjack. If Let's say I'm the best blackjack player in the world, which I'm not, but let's say I am. The next best blackjack player in the world is probably just as good as I am or a slightly below because it's a very easy thing to model. Well, all of a sudden, uh, you know, basketball being hard to model, Daryl is able to gain an advantage. The second thing I remember you told me is you said, I'm trying to be one out of, you said this exact thing, I'm trying to be one out of 32 teams to win a championship. So yes, I am incentivized to take more risks because I want to win a championship. That's my goal. I, I guess the challenge for sports teams is to make that extra, take on that extra risk at the right time uh, and have a belief that while, you know, if you're, you know, you, it's not one of 32, you know, you, you have to assess where you're at and what taking that risk is going to add to your probability of being that one team at the end. I don't know if I agree. So are you saying that like, if you are a middle of the road team, you shouldn't take the same risks as you are as not, a bottom of the road team? Or? Not necessarily. What I'm saying is that you have to understand where you're at and when you, you it's fine to make risky decisions. I think risky, you know, it, it, that's not a problem. The qu question is one, understanding what that risk is and understanding that that, you know, your decision, your is going to shift your odds of winning the championship differently based on what you're, where you're at as an organization. But is risky going, are we now talking about risky going against the data or is risky going against the grain, right? The data just informs you what the risk is, I think. But what, what, how are we defining risk here? Well, I was, I was about to say, so part of it's the word, right? So people see risk as a negative word. It might not be a negative word, but, but uh, really we're talking variance. Yeah, uh, yeah. so like in, in, uh, in baseball, for example, um, where most draft picks do not, pan out, you would really prefer a high variance drafting strategy. And, and one problem that teams like, uh, like the Blue Jays, for example, found for a few years is that they were taking safe college guys and wanting with a lot of uh, 
4A players, right? Um, guys who, who were major league fringe players who, who were not going to be total flame outs, but were also not going to have much star potential. So, um, so are you being risk loving by, by drafting kids with more upside? I mean, maybe in some sense, but really it's just kind of what the, what the mathematics of, of variance commands in that situation. A lot of our offseason was about variance, so we, we, uh, we didn't really have someone to build around, so we were searching for variance anywhere. Jeremy Lin, very early in his career, uh, very high variance of what he would become. Omar Ashik playing 15 minutes a game, very high variance. Our draft picks were high variance. Uh, the Harden trade, he was a backup, was high. So we were trying to find, uh, hopefully, that these things would, hit, uh, some of them would hit to sort of turn the corner for us. So that was one thing. One more, anything else? One more question, and then we got to wrap up right there. Shout it out. I didn't understand that at all. Sorry. <laughs> Next, uh, one more. So, I'm sorry. I didn't get it. <laughs> Did someone else understand? No, no. Okay, I didn't. I mean, I'm sorry. Maybe it's a bad idea. One, one, one. Right, shout it out. Ah, uh, good. This is a good question. How do you fight the observer effect? So he's talking about the observer effect, which is once the people know what your models are saying are going to make you look good in a draft model or make you look good in a player model. Well, the, the famous one is Shane Battier stopping taking heaves because he knows everyone's looking at his shooting percentage. Yeah, how do, you, how do we battle that? I mean, I just think that you have to make sure that your whatever metrics you are really are aligned with what you ultimately want, which is winning, right? And if you, have bad, if you have bad metrics that people are optimizing for and that doesn't make you win, it's not the problem with the process, it's the problem with the metrics you chose. That wouldn't solve the draft, though. So like if, if draft players figure out, like, OK, I know the Cleveland Cavaliers really value block shots. So I'm just going to go for blocks. Screw everything else. And, Does you and really want to go to Cleveland? Or what's why? that? Does you really want to go to Cleveland? Or? <laughs> why? We almost made it through the pass. <laughs> I mean, I, I, again, I still think that's a problem with the metrics. Like, it, why are they, why do they like lock, lock shots so much? Well, most of the time probably because it's a sign that they're athletic and they have some defensive, you know, and if, if that's not true, then, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think part of it, you know, I mean, Jeff's right in the pure sense that you want to make sure you're measuring the same thing. And if, if you are measuring the, the right thing, the really right thing, then great. They're going to go and do it. And you want them to anyway. Uh, but the truth in, in the draft and you know, player evaluation, we don't have that at all. And so we have sort of proxies for things that we hope are, you know, that blocks are proxies for, you know, uh, good defenders and uh, whatever it is. But um, so you just you have to protect it. And you, know, you don't want people to know what we really care about. Uh, and when you do give somebody incentive, you have to make sure it really is the right incentive. Uh, because you know, people put, people re respond to incentives in often ways we don't really know. We can't imagine when we're designing the incentive to begin with. This is why black box models are very dangerous in sport. I think because, in fact, you shouldn't accept them from your staff. Because uh, I think if unless you understand what's going <laughs> into it, then you can't adjust for if someone's gaming it at at some level. So, well, I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you to the audience.